Hello, book lovers, and welcome to another episode of Authors Love Bookstores from a Mighty Blaze. I'm your host, Joe Moldover, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. For the last 78 episodes, Kimberly Hensel Lawrence and I have come to you with independent booksellers and authors from across the US and Canada. But today is a special episode because we've crossed the Atlantic to support three wonderful British independent booksellers. My guest today is Josh Cohen, author of the book, How to Live, What to Do. Josh is a psychoanalyst in private practice and a professor of modern literary theory at Goldsmiths University of London. His previous books include How to Read Freud, The Private Life, Our Everyday Self in an Age of Intrusion, and Not Working, Why We Have to Stop. He lives in London. And Josh, welcome. It's good to see you. So good to be here. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I'm delighted. And um, we, uh, on most weeks, we support one independent bookseller. Uh, you've taken on the task of supporting not one, not two, but three. And so we're going to um, get down to that in just a moment. But I, I want to begin by um, talking to you just a little bit about uh, this uh, this wonderful book, which I've read over the last week. And... Um, and 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 the writing of it and uh given that you're a psychoanalyst i'm a clinical psychologist we should probably go back to the beginning and talk about your childhood so um you had a wonderful anecdote at the beginning of this book about peanuts and uh and your love of the charles schultz peanuts comic strip as a child and when i read that um it made me so happy because I hadn't thought about Peanuts in years, but I loved it. I remember my parents giving me these sort of thick anthologies of Peanuts cartoons, mm -hmm. and I would just sort of read them again and again and again and again. And um, so I would I would love to kind of touch on that for just a moment and wonder if you would say just a few words about that origin story for you and maybe specifically about the role that that comic played in your love of literature. Well, we already clearly have a great deal to talk about if you whiled away lots of hours inside those those thick books of, of uh, Schultz cartoons. Um, I got my first one when my parents returned from uh, a trip to the US, actually. They, they'd gone on a cruise. It was the first sort of big holiday they'd taken without the kids, and they'd left us with my maternal grandparents. Uh, my brother and I had had a great time without them. Um, but nonetheless, they came back with guilt and therefore bearing abundant gifts. Um, the only one that really caught my eye there and then, I was about five, um, was a, a big red book with the title Don't Hassle Me With Your Size Chuck, which had this great image of this rather hapless looking boy uh, bald-headed boy next to a rather furious looking young girl uh, who turned out to be peppermint patty so she is telling him not to hassle her with her with his size um well i i found the, the sort of flood of emotion with my parents back and greeting everybody a bit much so i retreated upstairs to the bedroom and i sat up uh on the bed with this book of cartoons on my lap. And the first one I came across uh, was Charlie Brown in Lucy's Psychiatric Booth, which itself, I suppose, has a, a mildly prophetic quality. And she tells him that uh, it's a problem that he doesn't really know who he is because He's five, and once a kid gets to be five, his character is pretty well established. And he says, but I, I am five. I'm more than five. And she says, yeah, you are, aren't you? Well, too bad. That's the way it goes. <laughs> um, it, it, the, the sophistication of the, of the rapport was a little too much for me. On the other hand, there was something about the simplicity but absolute precision of the mark indicating the emotional state of each of the characters 
that was so powerful um, and that just drew my eye very intensely. And I didn't really understand everything that was being said, but I understood some kind of undertow. I understood that it was about not quite knowing who you are or what it is you're like, feeling diffused, feeling like no one identifies you as any particular way, in the way that my older brother seemed effortlessly to establish with everybody. And so the lovely sort of paradox or irony about this was that the first time I felt really recognized by a book was the moment that it talked about the difficulty of being recognized and of recognizing oneself. Um, just having that predicament, because to me it was a predicament name, um, of, of sort of having to define and describe yourself and having really no, no, not the first idea of how to go about that. Um, now that I, I can sort of recast that in the light of a, a adulthood and think about how generous that is, the, 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 the generosity of Schultz's imagination in being able to give some kind of shape, some kind of lining for kids to very inchoate anxiety. So, I mean, I say in the book, only exaggerating a little bit, that I think of Peanuts as a kind of first analyst. But I think that in that sense, it, it gave you what a good analyst or therapist does, which is it, it suddenly gives a little shape and definition to whatever it is you're bringing. And of course, when you come, often you haven't got a clue what it is you're bringing. Right, right. I love that. I think that's wonderful. And I mean, I think that, you know, those those comics are, um, they are so brilliant in taking these sort of very complicated ideas about psychology and about groups and about relationships and, and making them sort of accessible, sort of making them sort of incredibly accessible, including to children. And, you know, I mean, one, I don't know if it's a connection that you've thought about, but I mean, one thing that I thought as I was then sort of going on and reading your book is that, you know, you're coming from a place of um, tackling uh, literary theory and psychoanalysis, you know, mm -hmm. two areas that are famously dense and inaccessible if you don't have, you know, a lot of um, academic training. And you are in this, in this book uh, making them... Um, Ex popularly sort of accessible um, through through story and oftentimes through humor. And it, to me, it sort of struck me as a very Schultz-like uh, endeavor. Um, so uh, I think you, thank you, you. you're continuing. That, that's continuing that's the highest that. compliment imaginable. So yeah, continuing in that tradition. Um, mm. uh, to the online audience, I want to remind you that um, you can certainly drop uh, uh, questions uh, for Josh into the into the comments and we'll certainly get to them. And I also wanna remind you that Authors Love Bookstores has the larger mission of not only speaking to great writers like Josh, but also of supporting independent booksellers. And um, the first one I'd like to just touch on today, Josh, is um, uh, Queens Park Books. And um, I wonder if you would just say a few words about Queen's Park Books. Sure, yeah. Um, Queen's Park Books opened uh, probably, oh, I, I don't remember the year, but I remember I had recently moved into near the neighborhood. Uh, Queen's Park is one of those neighborhoods where you tend to live one neighborhood along because it's a little too expensive to actually afford. Right. Um, uh, which, of course, is why they're able to support an independent bookstore. Um, but it is a bookstore that very quickly um, uh, obtained the loyalty and the love of the local population. And it's very easy to see why. It's a very straightforward, deep rectangle um, with, um, you know, not a massive sort of uh, megastore collection of books, but a, but a really well, intelligently curated uh, shelves of contemporary fiction, and poetry and nonfiction. Uh, the new releases stand uh, always look that the tables always look like they're very precarious, that they're, they're sort of 
you know, these beautiful house of cards, which at any moment are going to be knocked over by an elbow and, you know, there's going to be some apocalyptic domino effect. But um, what I like most about it really is is the booksellers themselves who are um, not just knowledgeable, but incredibly friendly and accessible. And one of the things that often happens in the store, especially on the weekend when it's very packed, is that, you know, somebody starts a conversation at the till with one of the booksellers and somebody else who doesn't know the first person gets into the conversation, you know, about whether the new Sally Rooney is really as good as the last one mm-hmm. um, or, you know, which is um, the better Lebanese cookbook. Um, and it, it, it's the exemplary bookstore as community space. Um, one of the things that, I, you know, they're very supportive of my books and they always get me to sign and they always put them in the window um, supporting. And they, they do that with all their local authors. Um, but one of the booksellers, I think it was Molly, uh, who started working there quite recently, um, told me she was, you know, in, in, a, in a very kind of sheepish way that she was admire, uh, an admirer of my writing. But what she was talking about were completely obscure academic books that I'd written about 15 years ago, um, which uh, which I loved. Um, uh, they, they're not, of course, books that will ever find their place on the shelves in the bookstore, but um, it was just an indication of the the range of interest that, that you get and, and the seriousness of, of the book. Then. It's fabulous. And um, we've been in touch with Jess at Queen's Park and Jess is ensuring that there will be signed copies of uh, How to Live, What to Do available. Uh, the website uh, for the audience, whether you're watching live with us now or in future time, doesn't matter. You can click on the link, uh, go to the website, pick up a copy, pick up some other books, support a great independent bookstore uh, during uh, what is a difficult time um, for, for many indies. Um, uh, and we will touch on a few more soon. Um, Josh, we're already getting a few uh, audience questions that I'm going to want to bring to you in just a moment. Mm-hmm. But um, but I'm, I'm just going to sort of hog the mic for just another moment and um, ask a follow-up of my own. Um, you know, you in, in the book, you frame the um, Peanuts uh, 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 Schultz background as sort of your origin story, like a superhero origin story. And um, and it's great. And I wonder if you would just carry it forward a little bit. In particular, you know, you have this extensive um, uh, professional background as an analyst and as a professor. You alluded to these books that you wrote years ago that were sort of highly academic and not widely read. What was the path to y- for you to writing for a popular audience? Sort of when and how did you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to help just anybody, sort of the educated layperson, understand Freud or think about their working life or sort of um, um, take on these topics and 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 how difficult or easy was it for you to kind of make that engagement? I was very lucky in the sense that I really had a facilitator. Um, it started I guess when I wrote an introductory I was invited by an academic colleague who was who was editing uh, a series called How to Read about the world's great thinkers and writers. And he invited me to do the Freud book. Um, he's a well-known philosopher who also writes for, for a popular audience called Simon Critchley. And, and Simon asked me to do the, the Freud one. So uh, I had an, a, a, a what was then a very young uh, editor, and I was a young writer, uh, both in our early 30s, um, who saw through the editing of that book. and. She liked it, and this was 2005. And I went back after that to my academic career. I think I was also about to start psychoanalytic training, so I was very busy. And if I had time to write, it was really that I had to keep up with my academic writing. I'd written books on American literature and continental philosophy, um, very, very small uh, and very niche readerships. But uh, Bella, the editor at Granta, um, who, just to flash forward for a moment, is now um, the the, the, chief, the um, editorial director at, at Granta. But she sort of kept nudging me and saying, you know, I like your book. I think you could do something bigger. 
I think you could do something more ambitious. I think you could write for a general audience, general, general readership. Um, and I kind of fogged her off. It wasn't something that I was really thinking about at the time. Uh, I was particularly busy sort of shuffling between the training and my full-time academic job. And over the next few years, as I got closer to the end of the training, something had really happened in my analysis. Something had opened up. Um, I think that what it opened up was not just that I had an intellectual interest, a career interest, um, a collegial interest in ideas. I think I was, and, and in literature, I think I was getting much more in contact with my passion for writing and literature. And that passion made me, A, want to communicate it more widely, but also more creatively. One of the things about academic writing, maybe this is a little less so actually these days, but, but 15, 20 years ago, academic writing was in a way quite a constricted genre. Um, there's a certain kind of jargon to it. There's a certain kind of structure to it. Um, you know, some academic books are more or less accessible than others. But in a way, if you want to make a scholarly contribution, then there's a certain set of expectations that you just have to buy into. And it seemed to me that if you wrote for a general readership, even though you had the obligation, of course, to be more accessible, more available to the reader, it, it opened out the ways in which you could do that, the ways in which you could talk to readers, the kind of voices that you could assume. Mm. And um, at, at a certain point, I, I felt ready to reply to my editor that, yeah, maybe I did have an idea. And it was a book uh, that I wanted to write about privacy, which seemed to me to just, uh, you know, all the different aspects of my interests, psychology, um, the inner life, um, literature, and also public life and what it meant to be public. All of these converged on this one question. And of course, questions about privacy were raging at the time. Um, uh, and particularly invasion of privacy. So I thought, well, what if I wrote about this from a cultural and psychoanalytic perspective? And what was most exciting for me about it was finding a voice that was singular, that wasn't generic, that wasn't sort of cookie cutter, that wasn't actually conforming to a certain blueprint of how a person should write, but was really discovering itself in the process mm. of writing. And 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 that I think just lay the ground for um, wanting to do this more, feeling also that it was possible to write about these more difficult, as you say, more dense and recondite thinkers, and actually think not just about you know the the finer theoretical nuances, but to think well how do these writers get us to think about ourselves and our lives and the world around us? Yeah. Um, which, which I think is, is, is something that academics actually are more interested in now. Yeah. Um, and maybe the world has, has forced us to be more interested in it, that sense of urgency. That's um, great. That's great. You know, you're, you're referencing sort of the role of the psychoanalysis in making that transition. And, um, we have a question from the audience about uh, psychoanalysis. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen. Uh, uh, Joshua, um, in another comment, shared that he has he's read How to Live, What to Do, and um, it had a question that you you mentioned in the book the sort of overlap or um, sort of Venn diagram overlap of psychoanalysis and Eastern philosophy and religion, and uh, and Joshua is asking whether you can explain how the practice of psychoanalysis is like Eastern religion, probably something that you know, it is, a, I'm sure it's actually in many books already, it you know, could be a book yeah, in its own, sure. but yeah. um, uh, can you um, what, can you share a, a, a few thoughts about that? Sure, I mean, it's a big, it's a fascinating and big question. Um, and as you say, there's almost a copy in three of books about psychoanalysis and psychology and Eastern religion, um, but, I, I would go to one word immediately, which is receptivity. That 
Psychoanalysis as a practice of listening and, as a, and, and of responding is about being receptive rather than active. Letting somebody else's mind in a way take over yours so that you don't listen with an agenda or with uh, a, a sort of a practical to-do list that tells the other person the solution to their problem, but you actually try to inhabit it. Try and let it sink into, let, let somebody else's mind sink into yours, be available to it that way. And that practice of listening, I think, is quite close to a lot of ideas about Eastern meditation, but also about in different Eastern religions, and obviously one is generalizing much too much here, but in different Eastern religions, the relationship of the self to the world. Um, that is that um, the self is not a kind of a, a, a master um, subject in, in charge or taking command over the world, but is trying to absorb its current, its wisdom. He, he's, he's, the self is a kind of conduit through which um, the world makes itself known. So that sense that real meaning um, comes out of being receptive to the other person and to the world around us, rather than imposing oneself on the other person or on the world. That I think is is the kernel of similarity. There are there are differences too that we could talk about, um, but but I, I think that's where people have found and do find the overlap. That's a wonderful answer, and uh, and Joshua, thank you for the question and for watching the program. Um, before I go on, I just want to remind the audience again about our support for independent booksellers. I want to mention another uh, British. Um, indie bookseller we want to support. This one is Burley Fisher Books. And um, Burley Fisher is not only a small indie, they also run a press, Peninsula, which has published a, um, a, uh, a small essay uh, called uh, Losers by, by Josh. There it is. Uh, links are in the chat. Josh, will you say something to us about Burley Fisher and if you'd like about Losers? Sure. Um, I won't say too much about losers, but um, Burley Fisher um, is a small, beautifully curated uh, little bookstore in one of the coolest neighbourhoods in London. Um, uh, it, it, it probably would think of itself as a kind of equivalent to Williamsburg in Brooklyn or something like that. Um, it's, uh, it's The broad area is called Hackney and the specific area is Haggerston. Um, and Haggerston is on a street that runs parallel with a canal. The canal has some wonderful, I mean, if you're visiting London, make sure that you get to this neighborhood. Um, there's all kinds of weird and wonderful stores and cafes and restaurants, and, and, and the people watching is second to none. Um, it's, it's, it's full of hipsters, characters, and in a way, Burley Fisher is exactly the kind of book a store that you you would expect to find flat bang in the middle of it. Um, it's got uh, a wonderful selection of contemporary fiction, particularly cult fiction, um, of poetry, um, and you will also find uh, you know a good selection of the best of the current mainstream, um, whether that's photography books, art books, um, uh, food writing. Um, they have some great um, uh, book events as well um, and it's run by a bunch of very enthusiastic, enthusiastic young people in their late 20s and early 30s and they also started uh, a small press, Peninsula, which published um, my essay and various essays in this series, Daddy Issues, um, uh, Replace Me came out at the same time as Losers um, uh, and and they also publish um, a lot of contemporary fiction. And, uh, for example, the American writer Lynn Tillman, um, uh, Peninsula are really doing an amazing job of sort of rehabilitating this great contemporary writer um, who isn't well enough known, um, uh, has sort of big cult status in pockets of the US and, and, and the UK. But... Um, 
uh, I, I think Peninsula bringing her to um, a new sort of 21st century, sort of 2020s readership, um, and it's it, it's very well deserved. Um, it, it it is another great place to get to, to sort of slip in the conversation with some random person. Um, it's the kind of place though that if you do get uh, caught up in conversation, you'll probably find that you know various people in common. That's great, and we're putting all of those links um, in the chat right now, so people can click uh, on the site, can look at the online events and uh, and the online store, and I encourage everybody to do that. Um, Josh, we kind of have a mixed audience this week uh, because we have psychologists with us, but then we also have, um, we're, we, uh, you know, our, our show is oftentimes viewed by writers and aspiring writers. And, um, and one very common uh, question or topic is um, how the hell to get writing done. And I kind of want to um, break into that with you by pointing out that, you know, the, the, the COVID pandemic I think has um, uh, made a lot of people sort of question the role of work in their lives, uh, the centrality of work, how much they want to work, um, and so forth. Uh, you um, were writing and delivering talks about not working uh, before it was cool. Uh, you know, you, um, uh, that's the topic that you were, you know, before the COVID pandemic, before the people were talking about it. Um, I'm going to sort of gently accuse you of being unqualified to talk about not working because my assumption is that you work something like 20 hour days. If you're a practicing analyst and a professor and writing for a popular audience. So this was a long winded way on my part of, um, of asking if you'd like to say a few words about not working, but also about working. And, um, and 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 producing the way that you do. Yeah, um, it, it's uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, prima prima facie, anyway, it, it is uh, a huge embarrassment, really, um, and it's it's actually quite difficult for me uh, to sort of finesse that to people who ask me about it because yes, I do work long hours. It's true. Um, the only thing I can sort of say in, in any kind of mitigation is that in many ways, the book is not, it's not a screed against work. Um, it, in some ways, it's, it's more about how we inhabit work, how we cultivate a relationship to work. Um, we have a relationship to work, I think, that is profoundly guilty, um, anxious, um, and that is driven by the, the a, a constant sort of self-accusation that one is not doing more, that one is not doing uh, work, working efficiently uh, or quickly enough, that one is not achieving enough, that one is not progressing um, uh, up the career ladder enough. And I guess I find myself fortunate enough to do the kind of work that in a way forces you to go at its pace rather than impose your pace on it. Mm. Um, so this relates kind of to what I was saying about psychoanalysis before. But of course, the same is true of reading. Reading also requires you to be receptive and to let the rhythm of a book take you over rather than try to, you know, if, if you're reading, for example, Wallace Stevens, who, who gives the title to this book, you can't speed read Wallace Stevens. You can't crash course Wallace Stevens um, overnight or binge binge read it. Um, you won't get anything out of it, you know. You, you, so reading often imposes um, or, or better kind of cultivates forms of slowness in us. Um, forms of meditation and reflection that actually get us to pause. This is what psychoanalysis is trying to do too. Um, and psychoanalytic work is, I, I'm not gonna pretend that it's easy, but it's difficult in a way that is, that is, I think, very different from 
other kinds of difficulty. Um, because you have to work hard not to do more, but to do less. You have to work not to rush to into the temptation to give an opinion, to comment, to know too quickly what a person is trying to communicate to you. Um, and so there is something that is intrinsically um, non-coercive about the rhythm of psychoanalysis, which is, I think, what people often appreciate about it. The people often come saying, this is the one hour I get in the week or the two hours I get in the week to, um, to, to think and live at my own pace, to not feel that I need to speak for any other reason that I have something to say that I would like to say. Mm. Um, and this is a sort of primary gain for me of, of psychoanalysis, that it, it, it puts you on both sides of the couch, I think. It puts you in a space where you're not, um, you're, you're not tacitly coerced into somebody else's rhythm, but actually you find your own. You, you listen and you let yourself be carried along by the pace of your own mind. So uh, I think that all that, 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 if I, if I'm suited to this work, it's because I feel like that was always the way I was. And at school, of course, it was a problem. And I write about this in not working and in how to live that I, I really struggled in, in sort of uh, up to sort of late adolescence in school because I simply couldn't keep up. I always wanted to learn and to, to develop curiosity about something at my own pace. And I was always four or five steps behind wherever the class was going, perhaps because something would interest me and I would get waylaid, um, or just perhaps because it took me longer to absorb what I was being told. Um, but I, I think that, you know, there is something about the, 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 the factory logic of education, the sense that it processes us through uh, a curriculum that is meant to be a, a kind of fully absorbed, that means that there is very little scope for individual rhythms of learning. And I think that's a great shame because I actually think that when you learn, learning how you learn is one of the most important aspects of it. Um, but instead we're told, no, you have to learn according to a, a generalized anonymous standard. Yeah, you've got to fit the mold. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very well said. Um, I wonder if I um, I wonder if I could ask you just a little bit more about um, about uh, how to live what to do in particular and about the organization um, of this book. Uh, the book, for those who haven't read it, is um, it you sort of organize it in sort of these like Ericksonian stages, you know, sort of like childhood and adolescence and um, you know, young adulthood and middle adulthood and so forth. And then, and, and then sort of within that context, kind of talk about um, different works of literature that kind of speak to the concerns of that developmental period, um, which, you know, strikes me as like a very psychoanalytic way of like, of, of tackling this topic, um, mm -hmm. which worked very well. Was it obvious to you from the beginning that that was the organizational structure of this book? Or was that something that you uh, that you came to later on a second draft on a, on a how, how did you come to that structure? It, it it did take a while to evolve because um, this was a book that I was initially approached by um, an editor at um, at um, Ebury who published in in the UK. Um, who had an idea really about doing a book about literature and the life cycle. Um, but he left it very much to me how to shape it and what books would go into it and what would be sort of the organising theme. Um, because, of course, adolescence and mid-adulthood and so on and, and late middle age, these can all um, mean very different things to different people. Um, 
more, of course, than any one book or any 10 books could encompass. So I, I decided to have these generalized themes that would correlate to the period. Um, adolescence then has a, there's a chapter on first love and a chapter on rebellion. Um, uh, in childhood, there's a chapter on play, but there's also a chapter on schooling. Um, I, I think one of the aspects, that, so there's a linear um, progress to, to sort of the lifespan um, in the book which is taken from developmental psychology and, and, as you say, has the influence of Eric Erickson. But there is also a more psychoanalytic, that is a slightly more nonlinear, although the chapters proceed through the chronology of life. There is one theme that I think in a way keeps coming up, which is the childhood theme. Um, the way that childhood and our relationship to the imagination in a way shapes our inner life at every step of the way. Um, so our capacity to rebel, or indeed the capacity to enjoy a live, meaningful, um, long-term relationship. Um, those kinds of capacities um, always pull us back into childhood, into the ways that imaginative expansiveness was was or was not facilitated by our childhood environment um, so and i think one of the most interesting things about looking uh, at the life cycle psychoanalytically is to notice how so much of what happens earlier is processed again through in the light of later events so that rather than thinking in terms of aging and maturing in a straight line um, our lives are always sort of remaking themselves and our childhood signifies and then re-signifies in a new way in the light of later events and that's also something that i'm trying to talk about in the later chapters so it, it it's trying to make the different stages of life speak to each other and 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 cut across each other rather than kind of abc linear progress yeah it struck me that sort of one potential role for the book is you could almost you know assign it in a developmental psychology course uh you know um because it sort of attracts so well um let's uh talk about one more independent bookstore before our time runs down um, um, I wonder if you just say a little bit about Five Leaves Bookshop in Nottingham, um, uh, another one that you wanted to share. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, to, to bring Five Leaves, that there are 10 other bookshops in London where I live that I could have talked about, but I thought this was a UK and not a London edition. And I, I thought, uh, you know, we're so often accused of being London centric in the UK. So um, it was important to have uh, a, a regional, a non-London bookstore. Um, Nottingham is a great university city, actually, um, and uh, sort of a, a, an interesting young place. Um, many people watching in the US, of course, their first association will be Robin Hood and the Sheriff. Um, but Five Leaves um, is a very distinctive bookshop. It is uh, got a kind of progressive profile, a progressive political profile. It specializes um, in books about climate justice, racial justice, um, different strands of progressive and left thought. Um, but um, a, a, alongside all of this, uh, it's got both a, a mainstream component, of course it sells all the sort of big sellers in literary fiction, um, it's, it, it also has very good holdings in poetry and has an insanely large selection of magazines as well. Um, you, you can find magazines on almost any subject, again, particularly um, in politics, you know, just just on kind of green issues. There's, there's a huge number of, of magazines. Um, uh, but they too, like like Burley Fisher, they have their own press um, and some particularly great poetry anthologies. So, um, you know, do do check out Five Leaves as a press as well as 
a bookstore um uh because they they've they've done some really interesting books and and um uh i particularly like for example an, an anthology they've done of british jewish poetry um Fabulous. yeah we're putting, we're putting that we're dropping links in the chat um i i wanted to actually ask if you'd expand on the recommendations a little bit we're sort of as we're getting down to sort of the final minutes i don't want to keep you too late because i know it's later in london than it is here in in boston but um uh we've we've dropped the links for lynn tillman into the chat and um you know i always hate it when people ask me to recommend books and authors because i immediately draw a blank and can't think of a single thing i've ever read but um but um that being the case i'm going to do it to you um i wonder if there's anybody that you've uh, read recently or are reading now that you'd um that you'd like to mention to the audience um as as you know um something they might especially if they loved uh what to live how um how to live what to do um uh perhaps something that they might they might turn to next yes um i i i because it's a uk edition i actually don't know if this book has been published in the us it may well have done um but i i don't know how much press it would have got but i i really enjoyed recently a volume of short stories and maybe volumes of short stories don't get enough attention but a young British writer called Chris Power um, uh, wrote a collection called Mothers. And I would like to just give it a bit of a shout out because it's an extraordinary collection, very accessible and written with a kind of emotional intensity that um, is quiet and surprising and rather devastating um, in amongst the various stories is a series of link stories, which which are, are called Mothers One, Two, and Three, um, which is really about the stages in life of a woman being um, uh, a daughter, a young mother, and then an older mother. Um, they are not for the emotionally faint-hearted. They really, I mean, one one quotation in How to Live is Kafka's wonderful line about needing books that smash the frozen sea within. And I really think that this collection is one of those books. Um, don't, not, not for the emotionally squeamish, because it takes you to the outer edges of, of your feelings. Um, uh, it's, it's not a comfortable read, but it is a, a, a pretty compulsive one, I think. Um, and he has, a wonderful and assured voice. Great debut collection of story. Wonderful, that's great. Um, I um, have a, a final question for you, um, and um, it's it's really about sort of the intersection of these two parts of your life. Um, your life as an analyst uh, doing actual, you know, uh, clinical work, um, and and then also your life as a writer and a literature professor um you know i you write i was i was earlier today i was reading an essay that you published in granta uh i think two years ago um i think the title is lazy boy and um you you write one of the things you write about in that essay is you write about melancholy and you um and you write about um this concept that i actually hadn't been familiar with called um acedia if i'm pronouncing that correctly <laughs> which mm -hmm. I, going down that rabbit hole on the internet, um, understand to be sort of essentially sort of a spiritual depression or yeah. a spir spiritual depletion. Um, I think a lot of your writing in, the, in that essay, which I recommend to everybody and is online, as well as I, I think in, uh, in Losers and some of your other political writing, is about the state of our world today. Um, which I'll characterize as not great. Uh, it's, um, it's really. Why, why would you say that? Uh, there's no, we only we only have a few moments left. I can't spell it all out. But uh, but you know, but you know, it's December. It's dark. I think that probably many of us have sort of a passing familiarity with the concept of spiritual depletion. Um, I I wonder if you'd say something about the role of literature. Um, in dealing with these types of feelings 
Um, you know, you said something sort of wonderful at the beginning when you were talking about uh, Peanuts, which is you said that you felt recognized by a book, uh, which I thought was just such a wonderful way to sort of characterize mm -hmm. that feeling and sort of strikes me as something that it, it sort of has a therapeutic quality to it. And so I wonder if sort of generally you'd say something about the role of, of literature in, in coping with um, pain. Yeah. Um, but, and also I just specifically wonder whether you recommend books to your patients, whether there are times with your analytic patients when you might say, you know, given what you're going through, I really think you should read some Virginia Woolf or, or, or something like that. Um, in response to the last question, I, I don't. Um, I don't because I guess it, it, it starts to feel a little too much like influence. Um, and, you know, we're trained to be very wary of the power of transference and not to underestimate the authority that you can assume for anyone who comes to see you. Um, and so in some ways, you always have to be wary of that authority by not imposing yourself too much. That said, I'm always interested and responsive when people bring books or TV shows or movies or music to the session. And then I may well respond or have something to say about it and try and, and think about why that particular book was meaningful to them in that moment, what, what kind of communication they're trying to make with it. Um, but in terms of, and, and maybe that speaks to the broader question you asked, because I think that what literature allows us to do is be in contact with feelings of anger and rage and sadness and frustration, all those emotional experiences we can have of the world today without feeling the need to rush to solutions or to tie it up neatly in explanation, to inhabit a state of mind. And one of the things that I was trying to do in Lazy Boy was, was say, I feel a kind of terrible, you know, the melancholy of, of that I was trying to describe, which is the kind of medieval Renaissance melancholy, the, the spiritual exhaustion that you talk about, has to do with perplexity, with feeling that the world has lost or, or rather, not as lost, is bereft of any kind of clarity or certainty that you look in front of you, you look at, you know, the, the news, the TV news, and you see only obscurity, really. You see only a fog. And to be able to, literature, I think, is a kind of solidarity with that experience. It's a solidarity with our strange, disturbing feelings of perplexity, of feeling that, that life and the world is, is strange and sometimes unkind and sometimes wonderful. But whatever it is, we don't have to rush to judgment or to resolve its dilemmas and complexity. But, but there's sometimes more reassurance, I think, in having someone say, does anybody else feel as confused by this as I do? Um, I, I, I feel like literature is far more valuable when it performs that service than when it tries to tell me what to think. I think that's so well said. And I think it, it also strikes me as encapsulating some of your viewpoint about analysis, I think, um, I don't remember if it was in the book or if it was in, a, I, I watched a, um, an, uh, an interview or a, a talk that I saw you give, where you sort of uh, talked about not uh, giving life hacks, you know, and things like that, you know, as an mm -hmm. analyst. And I think it's um, uh, such, a, such a sort of a wonderful and difficult viewpoint. Uh, thank you. Um, I've already kept you longer than I said that we would. Um, I so appreciate you being here with us today and uh, joining this, uh, joining us. And um, thank you to the audience. I apologize if we didn't get to every single audience question, but thank you so much for being here. Um, we are supporting today Queens Park Books, Burley Fisher Books, Five Leaves Bookshop, um, 
all in in the UK. The links are in the chat. Go there, uh, have them ship you books, support independent bookstores during a very difficult time uh, for that industry. Um, if you haven't already, pick up a copy of Josh's uh, new book. If you have it, go into his back catalog of his old books, pick it up for um, uh, as a gift for uh, for somebody in your life. I know lots of people who seem not to know how to live or what to do. I'll give them copies uh, for the holidays. So uh, so pick up a few. Um, uh, as always, uh, thank you for watching. We will be back next week for our 80th episode. We are jumping from Britain to Michigan to speak with the wonderful author, Viola Shipman. Um, Josh, thank you again. Total thank pleasure you so speaking much. to you. And uh, we very much appreciate it. To the audience, stay well. Keep reading.